And they said, what do you mean? I said, excuse me, y'all, for I'm going to reflect. I said, this ain't school. Like, this is not school. Like, I don't know what this is, but this is not school. I mean, we had a doctor. We had a bell schedule that we followed. We had classes that we went to. But in terms of just the richness of the academic environment, I said, oh, shoot, what did I, what did I forfeit? So I did. So that was my first learning as an educator. And I didn't know that I was going to be an educator. Um, and don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that everything at West Philly was bad. Some things I've actually had some really great teachers there um, and some great experiences when I was at West Philly. And I was only there for one year, my senior year. So for the central people, nobody gets kicked out at the end of their third year. I was one of those people. Like that is like really, really bad. So when, um, and I'll fast forward to when I became an educator. So I did go to Temple and I came right out and I was in math. Love, 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 love teaching math. My, favorite thing to do, even with everything that I'm doing now, I still tell folks, I still have yet to find something that tops being a teacher in the classroom. But I do understand the impact that I had or the opportunity and the opportunity that I had. Because I was a teacher at Germantown High School, which is now closed. So teaching at Germantown, which was a very rough school at the time, and, you know, but it was one of those things where I just really thrived in that environment because one, relating to the students was very, very easy. I was 25 years old when I started teaching. The kids were just like, okay, you're just kind of just like us, but you know stuff. And I said, yes, you can be just like me and know stuff. And so when we think about why representation matters in the classroom, it truly matters. So that was another learning that I had as an educator that, oh, a kid see, you know, they say in order to be it, you got to see it. So I wasn't asking all my students to be, you know, math education majors, but it was, you can learn math good at mathematics and it's not it, it is it's another language but it's not a foreign language you can learn it and so how do we go about and thinking about our learning a little bit differently but you can still listen to whatever hip-hop music you live you can live, you know, listen to you can live in certain zip code and you can still be educated you don't have to change everything about yourself or your identity in order to be an educated person of color right so that was a, a tremendous learning for me um, also, I was a boys varsity basketball coach. That was great. I had plenty of social capital in the building. I had a ton of social capital. Um, and I'll tell you, and as a teacher, the best compliment that I ever received from a student, and I remember, was, um, and I had been, I had been at Germantown for a few years, and I, was, and I tell everyone that's on that, you're really not good at, I don't care how good you are on your first day, you're really not that good at selecting third year. The third year really comes together. But some stuff you're just doing like off the of instinct, and you're trying, you're doing the third year, it like comes together. And so I think maybe my, my fourth year, I had some ninth grade algebra one students, and the kid walked in on the first day, and I introduced myself. They kind of knew who I was, and we were going around and doing stuff. And he said, Oh, you missed the heck, heck, right? You missed the heck. I heard you tough, but you're cool. <laughs> Ooh, I felt so special because it was like it's sinking in that because my expectation were ridiculously high for my students, right? But my supports were really high. So I am a firm believer, and, you know, I, and I didn't pick up this, you know, high expectation, high support, so I did some restorative practice training, but it resonated with me when I first heard it, but that was who I was as a teacher, because remember, I was a really bad student. I didn't like school. That central environment didn't resonate with me until it was gone, and then I was like, oh, shoot, I do like that academic environment, like that rigor, kind of, but it was like a lot of work. You know, I didn't understand homework. You know, because I was good at math, so why do I have to do homework? If I can get an A or B on every test, why are you grading my homework? I'm good, don't do that. And the teacher graded my homework, and I got zeros for homework. And I failed the class because literally I said, I'm not doing homework, I don't need to do homework because I thought you just want me to demonstrate what I've learned on the test, right? I got that, but why do I have to do homework? I learned later on, yeah, homework is important for some students, but how do you balance it to make sure that either make your class a little more rigorous, so that way a student has to do some homework or has to practice on their own. The same philosophy as a basketball coach. If it's too easy, then I need to kind of raise the stakes for you and the expectations for you, but I need you to work on certain aspects of your game. You're talented, but you're not that talented, right? You're not that efficient. You're not that much of an expert yet. You're just riding on the counter. So I need to raise the expectations. And so doing that was just something that was really critical for me as um, and I was talking about my daughter is at Central now. I have issues with some things that happen there. I know we're being broadcast, so this might get out. But it's okay. <laughs> because 
like when I think about how we how we grade stuff. So when you talk about expectations and you know support. So like the district has a grading system right now where you know every teacher is supposed to use this online grading tool, but you have some teachers who don't wait certain things. So if everything is weighted the same, then everything is a test. So homework is a test, a quiz is a test, a test is a test, a little assignment. Like if you so a kid can never have a bad moment if you weight everything versus like a quiz should be like not as much of a test because it's just a quick little check-in to see if you learn something that we just did recently, right? And so I have issue with that. And, or how do you make a test more rigorous for students? So do you try to trick students or do you just really kind of like set it up in such a way that you're like, you know what? How do I how do I set up an assessment? How do I create an assessment that will at least give students an opportunity to demonstrate what I taught? Or actually for them to demonstrate what I what they learned based on what I taught, and how are they able to do that? And can I throw in a few extra pieces to be a little more rigorous? Because I remember I had a student, her name was Renee. I'll never forget her at Germantown. Really, really bright girl. She probably could go, she could have gone to something like ridiculously smart. So I would make a test for my class, and she would like those things out and like it like that. Oh man, I gotta put more questions on today because this is just too easy. I gotta make it sweat. So when I started thinking about my assessments again, it was all right, I need to make sure that okay, these are the things I taught this week. I need the students to demonstrate that they learned them, but I need to do something for the days of the world. So let me throw in a couple of class, a couple of questions. It wasn't to trick her because we, we did it, but I really needed to see if she got it. And then what I saw that other students started to be challenged too because they're like, Mr. Hecky, why did you put that hard question on there? And I said, that wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. Do you want it to be for you? Well, this is what you need to do. And then, and plus, and I also we did questions appropriately. So that means, you know, if you didn't get that question right, it didn't mean you got F and S. It was you could still score well, but making sure that I still had a bar. And the most amazing part was not watching the May sweat, but watching other kids sweat. And then when they would get it right, they're like, I didn't think I could ever get it right. I said, you got it. It doesn't matter how the length of the, I mean, it doesn't matter like how big an equation it is, but if it's based on what I taught you, follow the rules, think logically about what we've done. Or you can say the same all the time, but what would I do? Funniest thing, uh, when I would teach sometimes when the kids would get stuck, because I would think out loud to them, right? Very intentionally. And then, so when they would get a problem, I said, all right, well, what would I say? Well, you would say combine my term. I said, so why are you asking me what to do next? You actually know the next step. And they're like, oh shoot, I do. And getting students to really realize and own their learning is just an important part. So that's why I love teaching. I don't know if that's coming through right now, but I really, 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 really miss teaching. Right? So anyway, fast forward really quickly because you'll figure out like how did this guy who started off as a teacher, well, one, he got kicked out of a high school. And I didn't even get into my college class. That's a whole other issue. Uh, I can come back to that. Right? It took me a long time to get through. Um, and, I, and some construction work thrown in there too. Right? So, um, and I tell, and I'm, like I said, I'm telling this so you get the, the understanding. And so, being at Germantown and seeing what that was, and then fast forward, somehow I got into a program at Lehigh to get my principal certification because I needed to get my master's degree and there was a fellowship opportunity. So, that's how I landed at Lehigh doing that and doing my principal cert. And I did one year at South Philadelphia High School as an assistant principal after completing that uh, class. And I was in a school where kids walked every single day. But at the time at South Philly, there was only pretty much like one high school because Audrey wasn't open yet. Ernest was still very small. And so you had a bunch of neighborhoods in that building all the time fighting every single day. And I'm not even going to get into the African-American, Asian, immigrant issue. That was a whole nother set of issues. So I got to witness that for one year, but then I was gone. Then all of a sudden, the following year, magically, I was at Springfield Township High School in Montgomery County with water polo team. As the assistant principal, <laughs> I made it again. That was as good as I heard you at South, which is cool. <laughs> what a rate. I was like, whoa, the first page better. Oh my goodness. So I'm out there in Springfield, and so, but I got to see the other side. And I saw an environment, once again, had high expectations, well resourced, especially compared to the Philadelphia district. And Springfield is not even close to the richest suburban district or in Montgomery County. So I've never, lower Mary was like, Mm -hmm. But compared to a Philadelphia school, Germantown or South Philly, it's like, what is this? Like, really? Is, is, is it that easy? Like, the technology in the building, you know, and back then, the Wi Fi worked. I mean, <laughs> like, it, it just worked, or if it was down, it was like fixed, like immediate, because it was crazy. Um, and I saw expectations of high support because I saw the number of counselors they had. I saw the, just the number of secretaries that were in the building. <laughs> I 
mean, you know, per student, it was the ratios were just so much better. The special ed programs and the number of people that supported children in special ed and the outcomes that some of the children had from special ed were like amazing to witness. And so I was there as an assistant principal one year. Principal the second, my second year there, and I saw principal there for two years. And bringing, and just so just seeing that experience and having that experience was like, once again, shaped another learning about who and what I would be as an educator. I didn't, I never saw myself as a chief education officer for the city of Philadelphia because that was an amorphous thing that they just created when the SRC came about. And I can talk about that in a moment. Um, but that was a, a real challenge for me. So, but it was, it was nice, but I was in my early 30s. The problem is I got the job in my early 30s. Some folks would say, oh, you should stay in Springfield and you could ride this out, or you become, you know, assistant superintendent in Springfield. Or become... And it was just like, mm, nah, I kind of needed to do something else. Then while I was there, South Philly blew up. And those of you who are from Philadelphia, or if you haven't done so, or when you're done, go look up South Philadelphia High School back in, I want to say like 09. There was a huge incident between Asian immigrant students and African American students at South Philadelphia High School. And so, um, well documented. Um, I think the inquiry team, like a year later, got a Pulitzer Prize talking about the total learning. A lot of it was because of what happened at South Philadelphia High School and also my transition going into the building. And so they asked me, I remember someone called me from the district about going into South Philly. Now, mind you, I'm still at Springfield. And I met my sitting in my field for a night lacrosse game. And my phone rings, they're like, oh, we want you to come back to South Philly. What, the school is in the paper every single day? You got to that. <laughs> but you have to be kidding. Why would I do that? <laughs> but I was young enough in my career to say, you know what, I'm going to take this risk and go back. All right? And so maybe I'm a Philadelphian. I love Philly. I'm not from South Philly. My father was born and raised in South Philly, so I, just, I know South Philly kind of well. I know at least historically. Um, what it's like in South Philly. I know about racial tension in South Philly because as an African American man, he was telling me like, okay, well, or a young man, it's like there's certain neighborhoods you didn't walk through, and it wasn't just, you know, it was like in, in the African American community, we had different neighborhood stuff, but you couldn't walk through the Irish community, you couldn't walk through the Italian community at like, certain times, a certain thing, but South Philly was a hotbed for racial tension, and it has been for generations. So what made this situation so different? And then so when we started talking. And when I had, so when I finally took the challenge, I said, I'm going to go into South Philly. My wife said, if you fail, I'm going to change my last name back. <laughs> because my name was all over the paper. And I said, okay, I think I can do it. Because I spent enough time in high school failing, even some of my college time trying to figure some things out that I knew in my professional career, you don't take a job to fail. So it's like, we're going to go to South Philly, we're going to get away. And so just working really hard at South Philly to address, and I could probably come in and talk for two hours about the issues around South Philly and some of the things, the underlying issues that created that environment in South Philly for that tension between African American students and immigrant students. And one thing that, you know, that struck me was just like, especially reading the article, because I was doing a lot of reading about the article, and they painted the African American students with such a broad brush as being like these brutal kids who just viciously beat up these Asian immigrants, right? And I'm using that and talking about how the set the context about how the article was written, not how I but it was just, it was very challenging for me. I'm like, okay, but wait a minute. I was there a year ago and I saw how there were like two sets of rules though for the kids in the school that were created by the adults, not by kids, that created tension. But I also know in South Philly, because I was here about South Philly, like, you know, you felt disenfranchised. That African American community has been there historically, has felt disenfranchised for generations. And then you, even when you go into a school that's supposed to be a shared space for everyone in the community, you have a different set of rules. Because they had a rule where the second floor was for, ELL students only. And so they separated the ELL students from the rest of the general population. And students would get suspended. You were caught on the second floor. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, why is this happening? So my first year there, I didn't understand, but I wasn't principal, so I didn't set policy. So one of the first things I did was, all right, we're going to break up the second floor because if we're going to integrate students, regardless of where they come from, then we, they need to be integrated into the school population. People freaked out. They were like, oh, these kids are going to be attacked. I said, but they've already been attacked. So whatever you did didn't work because they still were attacked. And then, and, and I was, like I said, there's a lot, and if there's questions later on, I can attack them, some of it. But I, the example that I will give came down between two girls one day, two, two young, two, two female students, Vietnamese students, African-American students, lockers were next to each other, right? 
So we set really high standards for, you know, if you have some, if you see something, report it, say something, blah, blah, blah. So two girls are at their locker before school and African-American girl um, is waiting. Uh, she's at her locker, Asian girl is waiting to get the Vietnamese student waiting to get to her locker. And there was something where there wasn't an excuse me that was used, right? So they kind of like walked by each other, but it was like, I because the, the, the Vietnamese girl just walked up and said, the African American girl, I need to get moved to my locker. Like really, boom, 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 right? Now, I know some folks who are Asian, right, Vietnamese, and they talk about how you talk to each other, right? Even among themselves, very straight, very direct. Very straight, very direct. What we didn't talk about to the students, or at the time, was that the word excuse me is only used in Vietnamese culture for a very formal situation. So they don't often say excuse me. Anyone ever been to Asia? You ever walk through? Asia? Anyone here ever been to anywhere in Asia? A really crowded part of Asia. Do you get bumped when you walk through Asia? Is it crowded in Asia? So imagine students who are, because I would get students like just been in the country for maybe a month from Asia, and they're walking down a, hall, a, a high school hallway, just bumping people. Bumping people, bumping people. If I go to King of Pressure Mall and I just walk through the concourse and I'm just bumping people, bumping people, and don't say, excuse me, do you think someone would say, hey, buddy, watch yourself? That's what the African American kids did, but they did it in their own way. But it's just, the feeling was still, you bumped me and you didn't say anything. So these two girls had this exchange that was like, oh, shoot. They don't know that, the African American students don't know that. Agents, this Vietnamese student, don't say excuse me all the time. So the, Asian, the, the Vietnamese student was never taught in America if you bump people or if you say something like, say excuse me, it kind of like diffuses a, a, a bunch of conflict. And I use that example all the time because that kind of sum, summed up what was wrong. And that's when I looked at the adult and said, we failed the kids by not telling them, if you're going to coexist, this is what works. So when Asian students would do something like, oh, excuse me, my fault, no problem because hallways are crowded. Kids are going to bump each other. That happens. But if you do it and don't acknowledge me, that's a problem, right? And so, and that's just like one incident. There was a number of other things that we went through to kind of just deal with that and unpack that and, and really try to shift how do we change the behavior of the adult? People would all, <laughs> often ask me about South Philly. How did, you, how did you do that? And I said, I focused on changing the behavior of the adult because an example I use for that is I, I talked about my daughter and the first time she spent the weekend with my parents who still live in the house I grew up in West Philly, when I went to pick her up, I think I dropped her off on Friday night and went to go pick her up on Sunday, she was a totally different person. Because she didn't hear no all weekend long. <laughs> because she was with my mom and papa. And you know, another learning about education, it was like, oh shoot, the behavior of the adult really does, it, it can impact a small child, a toddler, because she didn't hear no, and then, and so, and if you're a grandma, you know, you might be like, yeah, well, I'm guilty, done that, right? <laughs> and, and it's like, and it was just like, oh my goodness, what happened to the shot? Because she was having like meltdown, like when we went to pick her up, because it was like, and I, it was like, no, and it was like, you need to go. And I was like, oh, the behavior of the adult really does impact how children behave. And so, really focusing on the, that component. Fast forward, we also adopted community school approach, and that's what landed you here. I didn't know that then Mayor Kenny, Councilman Kenny, Paying attention to all the stuff that was going on in South Philly. I mean, he's from South Philly, so he doesn't care about what's happening, but about the changes. And so, one of the things that when he was running was talking about in his first term was about community school. So, um, and I remember he came to spoke at one of our graduations and he did stuff and that. And he was always like, if you need anything, just call me. I barely had to call him for anything, but I didn't know that he was paying attention to what we were doing. So we were making academic progress. So even as we were building out community schools and looking at obstacles and barriers that negatively impact child learning, I also had a leadership coach and instructional coaches who like I worked with a ton to help move the instruction, but also develop the teacher, teacher capacity. So I had teachers who had never been in leadership positions that I was trying to identify. Who wants to help lead? Who wants to do something different? Who wants to be a little more innovative? Who, want to have, who wants to have different expectations for students and different approaches to how we teach? what we want them to learn, and how do we want them to demonstrate what they've learned so that way we can keep them engaged in the work. Because I remember once again when I was that student that, ah, oh, no, this was like the traditional boring kind of, and like, I, I know that, but the way you're asking, I don't feel like demonstrating it that way. So, but if you just ask me, or if you ask me something else, I can demonstrate what I've learned. Because sometimes I would talk to teachers, I'm like, oh, you do know this. I said, I do it. I just didn't want to do it on the test. I didn't want to do your homework. 
but I love learning. And that was the, when I went to West Philly, I was like, oh, shoot, I'm not really learning a whole lot here. So I love the learning part of it, but it was like, right, how do we demonstrate what we've learned? And those of you that are probably studying this or, or doing this work, you know that there are multiple avenues, pathways for students to demonstrate what they've learned. And I saw that at Springfield because, especially in the special ed classrooms where you had students academically may have been strong or may have had some other learning disabilities, but they were like really flexible with how they allow students to demonstrate what they've learned. But then you go to South Philly where you have a high concentration of students with the highest needs. 33, 34% special ed, 24% ELL when I was there, and there wasn't a lot of overlap. So by law, more than half of my student population required some type of specialized instruction. And we're being very traditional in how we allow students to demonstrate what they that's horrible. Like that, that really, really bothers me. So getting teachers who are like, oh, we can do this. Because this is something I've been chomping at the bit. Because the thing you know, if you open the floodgates a little, if you open the gate a little bit for some <laughs> teachers to do some things that are innovative, and you just say, look, I'm going to trust you, but these are the results I need to get. And then I just step back. What supports do you need? You tell me what you need. I'm going to bring it in. So instructional coach, instructional coach, let's talk about strengths, where they are, and let's develop those strengths. And let's focus on that and let's see if we can build that up and then build that up not just with individual teachers but among the you know among the departments and so working on different so some departments were really quick to lean in some not but then i remember the first year i think i think it was um, our math department we made ayp based on the number of students that we increased the number of students at the time who were proficient by more than 10 percent and I remember that day, and I was like, so I was ridiculously excited. South Philly really never did it. It was one of those schools that, especially academically, we never got it. And we did it. But you know what happened? The English and Social Studies Department were heated. I wouldn't use another word. <laughs> they were heated about it because they were like, wait a minute, math department made it? So they actually paired up with the English and Social because they're like, you know what? We do a lot of reading and writing and our discipline. So the two leaders, Teacher leader said, let's work together collaboratively. And then so the next year, English, we made AYP based on the number of students who were in proficiency. Because they like to say, oh no, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and they offered from the math class, I mean the math department. And so it was like a friendly competition that we had going on because we had energy around teaching and learning. And really, because it's not about what you taught, it's what the students learn and can they demonstrate. Because I would hate when teachers, and I was guilty as a teacher too. Well, I taught it, but they didn't learn it. You really teach it. You may have demonstrated something on the board. You may have gone through the motions, but I thought teaching and learning, I mean, it has to kind of go hand in hand. So if I'm teaching something, but you're not learning, then I'm not really teaching. So I need to change my approach. I need to change what I'm doing. And then I need you to demonstrate it. And how do I, how do I allow you to demonstrate what you are? And so those were pieces that we started to do at South Philly. And then all of a sudden, Mayor Kenny gets elected. And he's like, okay, do community schools, but also you're going to be chief education officer. Because I really thought I was just going to help expand community schools across the city, which to me was like an amazing win for something that at the time the school district didn't even embrace. Because like they wouldn't call it a community school. I was trying to adopt community school approaches to what we were doing, but they didn't fully adopt it. But this, this guy, Jim Kenny, said, we're going to do community schools across the city, and I want you to lead that office. But also, hey, you know what? We're going to do pre-K. I don't know anything about pre-K, Jim Kenny. <laughs> okay, well, so you have to get a team together and figure that out. And so we built up the two programs of community schools. We did uh, in the first term. So we had uh, 17 community schools across the city uh, for pre-K. We built a debt program. We have 3,300 students that are funded through that lovely beverage tax. We'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to ask some questions about that process. Um, and, and really thinking about how we that continuum of education. So with a lot of focus on the early childhood piece and also community schools. And so we're looking to expand. So we're hoping to add to this, get up to 20 or 22 community schools and add another thousand um, seats that we're funding. But there's issues around that. Because when you think about pre-K program, right? If there's a focus on quality, it's not just where does your child go between eight o'clock, you know, three, four, thirty, or whatever time the pre-K day may be, right? Is, are you making sure that a child is in a quality space? I got an opportunity to go see the pre-K space up there and it looks amazing. And it's just like, so you all know that are doing that work, how important quality is in terms 
of making sure that those three or four year olds are in academically rich environments that are appropriate for a three to four year old, but also set them up for that, you know, that kindergarten ready. So in order for us to add thousands of seats, quality seats, we have to make sure that there's a system that's ready to absorb them. And those of you that do our study pre-K, you know that is very hard. Very hard. Every pre-K center is not a quality pre-K center. And every pre-K center that might have three or four star may reach certain thresholds. But when you go there, you're like, mm, it's it's good and it's safe for my child to be here, but academically is it rich enough to provide them they need because it needs all those things to be put together. So those are the things that we've been working on. So I preface all of that so that we have context a little bit, but also buckets to talk about when we do the question piece. So we think about um, the second term. So Mayor Kenny gets elected, and he talks a lot about education. They call him the education mayor, which is really scary when you're chief education officer. So that means there's more work for you to do, <laughs> right? So he makes decisions, but you know, then you're responsible for making sure you can act. So if you build a plan, he just says yes, no to them, right? And I'm not going to minimize that. Uh, because of everything that's on your shoulders. Uh, but when we talk about our values and approach, one thing about working for someone, they call it education mayor, the chief education officer, it's at the forefront of whatever we do. So things that I need, I get, for the most part, not everything, but I get a lot of what we need because those were important initiatives, and like I said, that better sex piece just added another layer of this better work. So I was a driver in the office to really get some things. Um, so just talking about the values and approach, and I turned to priorities, and then a vision for education that we're starting to develop that we need to roll out. So we, like I said, talking about with Mayor Kenny, with the education piece, right, and how he feels about it. One thing, love him or hate him, if you want to know what he's thinking, just ask him. And I can tell you, read his expression, he, can, he does not have a focal face. Um, but when you think about equity, we are focused on equity. Um, on, the, on the first day of uh, the second term, he signed an executive order um, for a new office that is like the uh, racial and equity office, where we're really looking at how do we how do we make sure or use an equity lens to all the parts of the programs that we build out to impact the people who need them the most, right? Or who also have been dis disproportionately impacted by bad policy. That is something that we have to put in place. Looking for opportunities for folks, we are we have an office of workplace development where we are really trying to like tie in how how are we preparing young people coming out of our schools to go into the workforce and go into college. So I have a few positions on how I think about that stuff as well. Um, and then the courage to just kind of take that work on. Um, behind the scenes on the beverage tax stuff was ridiculously hard. You know, people did not like the beverage tax. Um, some people were, were super supportive because of the programs, um, but it was still, it was just a regressive tax. Is it going to negatively impact poor people? Uh, blah, 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 blah. And I would always say, well, so does a lot of sugar. Depends on what kind of tax you want to call it, but it's a tax. One day you have to sell a tax out of your pocket or a tax at all. Um, and I don't say that in a quite judgmental way, but I just think as a community, though, those are things that we need to educate ourselves to, regardless of the tax itself. Um, compassion. He is very compassionate. He loves being in schools. He loves being with kids. And so, in, in the collaboration, um, it's just been something that has been a part of this administration. Are there still silos in city government? Yes, but things are getting better, especially in education, and I'll get to the local control piece, because that was a huge piece. So things that we're looking to do, um, and all of this is relevant, and I remember first term, before the first term started, after he announced his cabinet, we had some meetings that December before the inauguration, and uh, all the cabinet members, and we got a budget briefing. So Rob DeVoe came in, and he did a budget briefing, and almost everything he talked about said, well, then it goes back to education. We don't have enough revenue here because we're a very poor city and we have very uneducated ed ed citizens. And or the business tax or the businesses that are not here are not coming here because we have undereducated workers. <laughs> and everything just kind of comes back to education. So, and you all know, right? I'm, one thing about this room, very friendly room, I don't have to explain the value of education, <laughs> right? All of those things just, it just kept coming back to education and then it kept looking at me and I'm like, I'm the new guy. I still had the keys to South Philadelphia High School <laughs> at the time. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you putting this on my shoulder? And by the, on my shoulder, and by the way, can I go to class in government or something? Can you, can you show me how government works, right? Because we 
watch it, but if you watch it, you know a little bit. When you work in it, you're like, oh, this is what really happened. It's just like when people tell us about how schools work, but they've never worked in a school. You know, if you've never talked about school, you're really sure you know what happened. You understand the obstacles and challenges our kids are having, and, and they could just be in a kid, uh, uh, you could be in a private school, and it's still hard. So how do we approach that? Um, but these are the pieces that in terms of the approach that we're looking at. How do we help move the needle on poverty? We all know Philadelphia, out of the, all the large cities, we are at the highest, 25% like of our population is living in poverty. poverty. And if you talk about folks living in poverty, it's ridiculously high. Then you go to certain zip codes, like 60, over 65% of people live in poverty. And that is an issue. And so how much do we own of that as educators? What are some other things systemically that have done? I mean, we can talk about racism, classism, all those other things that have definitely created those environments. And, and I, fortunate, I try to be being on cabinet is an interesting space. I'll talk about this real quick. Is, especially as an African American man on the mayor's cabinet who's born and raised in the city of Philadelphia, and you hear how people talk about issues. Not, and they're all well intended. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing. But it's like, how do you stay in a room without being angry? I'm telling you, it's hard. And so I've had people who have challenged me, especially advocates, and like, oh, did you need to say and do more? And I'm like, if I do that, I'll, I'm out of the room, y'all. Y'all need me in the room. And so I felt those open. I said, I have to be in the room. I may be, I may be raging inside, but I said, I can't say everything I need to say, but I need to move the needle enough. So that way I'm like, okay, I have severities in place. I said what I need to say. They heard what I needed to say. And so let's see if we can do something about that policy to address that. And so, and, and I'm not the only one, don't I'm not going to act like I'm out there. Out there by myself, but it does once again where representation matters in which your roles are in cabinets or on teams because there are issues that, unless you live them or study them or just really, really understand them at, um, um, intimately and deeply, it's hard to explain why that policy impacts this this community and everyone's looking at a community like, what's wrong with it? So I, I definitely don't judge folks that way. Um, and so how do we think about the future generation? So for me, as educator, as educator and also, how do we break generational poverty and start having access to generational wealth? So I talked about my wife and my daughter, right? So I look at the life that, that I had growing up on 56th Street, West Philly. Like I said, my parents were there. My wife is from Westmoreland Street in North Philly. If you know about Westmoreland Street, I don't even think the house she grew up in is there, it's gone, or whatever. She did really, now she did something right. She was real smart. She was <laughs> really, really smart, right? And um, and so when I think about the life that we had growing up versus the life that my daughter had, so, and it's like kind of funny, like I grew up in, my wife grew up in Northville, I grew up in Westville, my daughter's from Northville, in her mind, so she like from West Mount Airy, and that's how, right, she, that's her perspective, those of you who know Philadelphia, West Mount Airy is a little different, so my child, sometimes I understand her, and then she does stuff that I'm like, what is that, but her perspective is just, has it's never been me. There's want, because all kids want something, but there's never been need, never been hungry, never really been cold, never, unless the power goes out to the tree falls in. And then we like, all right, how long is it going to be? Two days, all right, then we'll go to a hotel. Growing up, we would have just had to sit in the house and figure out how to stay warm until the power comes back on. Totally different world. But I'm like, wait a minute, does this break generational poverty? And so people like will hear humor in that, but it is really deep for me. And I'm like, wait a minute. I got to make sure that she has some sensibility about herself and her background, don't get me wrong. But it's also, I can't put that burden of generational poverty on her because she, that's not her. And so even when we talk about privilege, and I love the conversation that folks are having about privilege, and they're like, oh, she's a child of privilege. I said, but the parents are, we work hard to get out of that. And that is, is, should that be a good thing or a bad thing? So do we stay in the space or do we try, or is our goal to really work our way out? So whatever we consider privilege, especially around economic privilege that relates to generational wealth, we should be raising, figure out ways to, to get more people to raise out of that versus, oh, we own that and we're going to knock all the folks who have got it, especially within the African-American community. So I really struggle with that. But there, there is, and don't get me wrong, I, I get the racial, social, economic dynamics of that, but I think for people, when you're a first generation something and your kid is not that, or she's moving into a different space, how do we have those conversations? That's a whole nother list. When I went to college, the first time I went to college, I went to Hampton University, and coming from 56th Street, and then I'm at Hampton University, which is the HBC, HBCU, beautiful, 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 beautiful campus. That was the first time I felt like black people, like, I had stuff. Like, walk, like, 
car. Like, yeah, you're like a freshman. Like, what is like that was so foreign to me. It was I I couldn't understand. I didn't know because I was from 56th Street. I didn't see a lot of like African American people in Philadelphia. I didn't know what folks in Atlanta or from DC or how they look like. Is it like that in Atlanta? Is that man, I need to be in Atlanta or something. Mm -hmm. And and so how do we really have this conversation? That's another piece that we can unpack a little bit. So term two priorities. Some of this focuses on me. Some of the funniest one is around like cleaner and safer streets. So and my first name is Otis, O C I S. There was an office that was created when the administration started, the Office of Transportation, Infrastructure, and Streets. <laughs> office, <laughs> Transportation, <laughs> Infrastructure, and Streets. Can you guess what they call it? <laughs> Otis. So they're like, Otis. And I'm like, Otis is not doing streets. And then, because they would do things, they're like, oh, when Otis does so and so. And I'm like, and people are like, oh, he's the partner, not the person. Yeah. And so it is still the running joke because they're like, oh, we we'll do streets, you know, Otis will do soccer. Like, Otis is not doing that. Otis is doing PK and community school. <laughs> so, but really thinking about safer and cleaner streets. And, and, and so those are the things. And really, obviously, we have diverse, efficient, effective government pieces that we work on. So, education. So, this is why we're here. <laughs> Local control. One thing that I should have done, in, 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 and I mean this respectfully, when I think about what I what I'm doing in this role, because when I got on the elevator, like my woman right here said, "Hi, Dr. Heckman, so please don't give me a credential I don't have." I should have been in, doing a dissertation while I was in the local control. You talk about some fun stuff, fun conversations about how do you pivot the school district, which was under state control for almost 20 years under the uh, School Reform Commission, and return to local control, and all the conversations. It should be an elected school board. Why does the mayor get to do this? Should we get should we get rid of the SRP? Should we keep it? There were so many conversations about should we do this? And the craziest part for me, because remember, I thought I was a principal before I started doing this work. And I was a teacher. I started teaching in 1998. SRC came into play in 1999. So I only knew the SRC. Because my first year of teaching, I was just focused on teaching my classroom. <laughs> that, that was a whole nother story. Right? So just trying to figure that out. And so now all of a sudden, even we're sitting around a table and we're talking about doing it, and people look at me like, all right, Otis, are we doing this? Ask Jim Kenny. <laughs> Otis, we looked at it, we, we've all discussed it, we studied before we really, really roll this out. Are you on board? That was crazy, like, but exciting at the same time to, as a person who, like I said, grew up. In the city, and now has the opportunity to have influence on what are we going to do next on bringing the school board, the school district back to local control. So that was a ridiculously big deal for us. Um, the great piece about that is now, um, and I like that. I take a ton of questions on that. Is really thinking about or or how the city now and the school district are working closer together than ever before. So the school district and the city are two totally um, different entities. The superintendent does not report to the mayor, right? So that the superintendent report at the time was to the SRC, now reports to the board. And the school board is appointed by the mayor. So even right now, the mayor was just reelected. I Monday on our day off, I was in the office because we were interviewing candidates for the school board because he had to reappoint the board because um, they serve con um, concurrently with the mayor. So, even, so once he was reelected, we have to reappoint a school board. Crazy part is, it gets two terms. So at the end of this, we're going to get a new mayor. New mayor can come in and say, you know what? I'm putting all, I'm putting nine new people in this school board. That's another time for those that are studying this stuff. Love those dynamics. In a couple of years, you're going to have a great opportunity to study what's going to happen with a new mayor and how they handle the appointments of a new board. And another wrinkle that was thrown in with um, the home home rule charter was city council trustees from down this time around have to approve. So before the mayor can just say we had a nomination panel, we have to buy the rule. Three, we needed three names per seat. So the first time they gave us like 27 names because hundreds of people applied to be on the local media on the school board. We had the, the nominating panel had to boil that group down to 27. Then the mayor asked for some more names. I think the total group was about 45. And then the mayor and cabinet, we had to interview people that we would appoint for the board. But we did not need approval from city council. This time around, we need approval from city council. So give us a couple of weeks and wait and see how that turns out. <laughs> Hopefully, 
hopefully not too entertaining, but there's, you know, I do have a little curiosity to see how it's going to play out. Um, so that um, work is just, it, it's just so important on how we do that. And we can talk about, you know, elected versus appointed, and, but I think in terms of what elected does, or appointed, I should say, is it puts a lot of pressure on the mayor. The mayor has to get it right with the nine. There's not a lot of other political influence that can, that can impact an elected school board. So if you think about the city of Philadelphia, um, and I'll just boil it down if you heard district versus the, you know, district charter conversation. Nine members. I don't need, I don't need to get nine folks on the board. I only need to get five. Imagine the money that would be flowing in different ways, right? And I'm not taking a side on things that could impact how that board is formed. So if folks really have a position, the, the big vote is really who's going to be the next mayor. And I would imagine on for that next go around, education has always been an issue, but it's going to be so much more of an issue because now you appoint a board who over, has oversight over a budget that's about $4.5 billion. I mean, 3.5, sorry. About $3.5 billion at the school district budget. So a lot of people want to have some influence over where that money goes. And so that's going to be a very interesting time um, to pay attention to. But we have made um, a $1.2 billion investment in school. Um, the facilities piece, uh, how do we get more money on the capital side? Some of that is based on things that need to happen at the state. The district has a ridiculous <laughs> increase in its capital budget, but there are a number of things that are happening in schools, as we all know, around the semester, especially happening all at once. So these are issues people can feel however they want to feel about Dr. Hyde how they're handling it. But these are issues that have been kicked down the road by previous administration. We all know asbestos has been bad for an awfully long time, and no one has decided to address it. And that, a lot of it is just aging out at the same time because a lot of buildings were built at the same time. And so we're having issues. And the district is also now actively looking for it. And as you know, it's just like trouble. If you look for it, you will find it. If you look for asbestos, you're going to find it. So I think it's how do we make sure that the public feel comfortable with, oh man, another school is closed down. What's wrong with the district? You no, know, we went looking for it. We wanted to see if there were any imminent hazards. So we are going to shut the school down. We're going to relocate the students here, get the school in order to where it needs to be, and get the kids where they're back in the space. That's kind of controversial for people on the public side to really understand, but from the operational side, they don't think it's just going to happen. But how much um, is the public willing to accept? So that's the piece that in terms of communication, how you communicate that message out to people, so that way they understand that you know, we're being very proactive about these aspects. Yes, we got kicked around because things weren't happening a certain way, but as you put certain protocols in place and build trust, well, people feel confident about what you're doing. And then once you declare a building safe, well, folks go back into it. And it's like, that's just not going to get you right away. I mean, some people would be up down. We talk, we talk about air quality and things like in certain cases too. Those can impact uh, students. Um, immediately, but how do we really think about how do we deal, uh, deal with uh, spaces? So we'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So when we think about local control, when we start to talk about this new vision for the city, and this is how all the educators and people that are doing work in the city from you know K-12 space to higher ed, is looking at great teaching and learning. I spent a lot of time talking about that at the beginning, because that is something that I'm very passionate about, and I never mind spending time talking about that, because that's something that adequately drives me, even in my role in government around how do we create environments for learning. That was my job as a teacher. I need to create a classroom where it is environment for learning. As a principal, what do I need to do to create the environment for learning? And now in, in, in my role in government, we get we just have to do that across the city. My classroom is probably the easiest one to do, you know, because you have so much control over it. And so now we have to really figure out how do we do that? How do we um, identify innovative ways to either, you know, renovate buildings, get new buildings built, are people going to be patient enough because you can't build a new building overnight? Do we even have a labor force that's ready to, to support? I can tell you right now, if the district is trying to do massive projects, sometimes they have to wait because everybody else is building all these massive buildings. Like we really have a workforce issue as well that has nothing to do with the education or even some of the funds. Some of it is, oh, construction companies just aren't ready to do that yet because they're busy. Like it's a, such a boom here in Philadelphia. And people don't always think about all those different drivers, things that are pushing and pulling on each other that make decisions or impact timeline. And so those are things that we have to think about. So we talk about um, great spaces and then strong supportive services. So right now, something that I'm ridiculously happy about is that the district, we, the city, in partnership with the district, we have an RFP for a $100 million investment around behavioral health. So every every um, school in the school district will have access to behavioral health by each building, not just a network or a neighborhood, each school will have this. 
Um, and another thing, like going back to the community school approach, that was always around high expectations, high support, was around the behavioral the behavioral support that my students needed. So I used to get in trouble with my staff at, at South Philly, well, with some, because, you know, you get your budget at, the, at, at around this time of year, almost, and now you have to start making decisions about who you want to keep, who you have to let go, because especially when I was principal at South Philly, it was during you know, really hard financial times. And I was one of those folks that it's just like, the district tried that thing. They tried to give me like two counselors in South Philly. Like, I said, you got to be crazy. I can't operate South Philly. I told you my population, right? More than half of my population requires some type of special needs. And then if I pick a specialized education, let alone almost all of them are poor, like in ridiculous support. So I was one of those, I always got extra counselor. I would, I be like, oh, English teacher, math, I'm like, nope, I'm going to use some Title I money to get a counselor because I can't. So I tried, my ratios were always a little higher. I think one year I had four, when other folks had two. They're like, how'd you get from me? I said, I'm working. Because look, my philosophy is your budget reflects your value. So if I want students to, and don't get me wrong, I want them to have the best academic outcome. But we all know if you are not emotionally or spiritually or psychologically ready to learn, it doesn't matter how good the teacher is in front of you. It doesn't matter. We know our kids are impacted by trauma so much. So I needed to make sure that those supports were in place. And that was something that I meticulously focused on um, at South Philly with the team. And so when I say I, it really is like a team of folks at South Philly. But it was as the leader, you have to set the tone for that. And in and, and the city of Philadelphia, as a principal, you have a lot of say. Sometimes we act like we don't. But you do over some budget pieces. You just you have to take a risk. And you, you cannot, you, you just have to take a risk and say, well, if I do this, and focus on support here. Can I get better uh, academic outcomes? And we started to see that because of just the support, where students weren't ashamed to ask for help, or they were having a, a, a bad, bad day. You know, one of the things I would say to students all the time was, "Don't let a bad moment turn into a bad day." Kids will look at me like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Nope." I said, "We don't let a bad moment turn into a bad day. What's wrong? Let us help you." And I know that's an oversimplification because depending on the number of issues that. But at least they could say, well, okay, all right, I'll go talk to somebody. Because I said a bad day turns to a bad week. Bad week can turn to a bad month. Come on, let's let's figure this out. Let's figure out what's wrong and let's say so that way you can get here. So I need to come back to school tomorrow. I need to talk to the counselor, talk to some other support, supportive services we have to go, but I need you to be in school because if you're just out there, you're not going to get any support that you need. And so once again, now if that student feels like one, this is a safe space for me to talk about what's wrong or what happens to me, not what's wrong with me. Um, and then getting them back in the classroom as quickly as possible so that way you're not losing that instructional time. So it, once again, a lot of things happening uh, simultaneously. And what I get to do now is working on great career or secondary <laughs> options. So as we have shifted to the second term, my new focus, um, there's been a new office created, the Office of Children and Families. So the programs that I help to build, create, are now in that office. Burden is off my shoulders. New burden is how do we increase access to higher education? So the first step for this administration is to build out programs with our community college. We need a more robust community college. Higher ed are ready, are ready to receive students out of high school, but also receive students out of community college. But we need to make sure that they're there. But what are some of the supports that students need? Once again, it's almost like running a community school. We know that there are obstacles and barriers. Excuse me that are, go beyond just um, tuition that negatively impact people from being full-time students at UK. So that is like my new focus right now. So like as soon as I leave here, I'm sorry I can't take the lunch, <laughs> I'm running right to CCC for traffic a fair meeting because the mayor's making his budget speech and like less than two weeks and we're trying to figure out the last detail of the program that we're going to put in place to support students. So we want to see more full-time students at CCC. We want to address the not just tuition, but looking at last dollar tuition that will close those gaps, but also some of the fees. So like for some students, if you're in like an allied health or some STEM related program, those, you didn't ever take your biology course as an undergrad and you got to pay this extra money for certain courses. For some people, they don't have the money like, oh, my tuition cut, but what about this fee? Oh, I don't have money for that fee, let alone the equipment, let alone this, let alone that. And I'm just trying to, you know, just get my associate's degree so I can transfer to a four year school. I can't do that. And so how do we look at even some of the fees that students have? How do we deal with food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation? I'm a little bit of a, I know enough about pre-K to be dangerous. How do we make sure that if, if you have a three or four year old, there should be no excuse given the number of options between 
Head Start, Pre-K Count, and now locally funded seats, because not every seat goes full. So I'm not going to, I don't want to hear, oh, I, I need childhood. We got you, and it won't cost you anything. We might need you to fill out a form. We need you to fill out, give us some information, but your child can go there. Oh, wait a minute, you're, you are like at 100% um, at poverty rate? Oh, you also will qualify for CCS dollars that will pay for core care, aftercare, and summer. So you can be in school full time. What else do you need? And so how do we begin to address that? And I'm not trying to oversimplify because it's very complicated, but sometimes we know for some people, it, it might be one barrier. And so, but it's a big one. So how do we address that? And then, so even to transportation. Um, so should they get a monthly uh, transport? So just make sure you can get to class all the time because we know that's a burden. If you're really poor, you have to make decisions between food or transportation. And if you're ever in a situation where you really have to make choice, like I said, my daughter doesn't have to make choices between things that she needs, it's between things that she wants. So we at least try to fill that in. She gets that part. But if it's a need, she doesn't understand why she doesn't have it. So for people who have grown up and I've been in a situation where you're like, all right, food or this, how do we address that? So those are pieces that we're looking at from the city side, but it's also the academic and the readiness piece of making sure students coming out of our public high school are ready to go into higher education. How do we reduce the number of remedial classes? So what's going on there? Who's the blame? Just like high school teachers, we always blame the middle school teachers. You send them to us the way that they are. The middle school folks blame the elementary school folks. And the elementary school folks are like, well, I'm an elementary school teacher. What should I know about, you know, algebra? I'm not teaching algebra. Yeah, but, you know, one thing I did say at uh, the, well, I, I spoke at the graduation here a few years ago. I said to all the folks in elementary education, I said, I need you to do one thing. I said, as a former math teacher, I need you to make sure you don't say this one thing that you can't do. Don't tell students you can't do two minus three. If you have two, you can't take away three. I said, please, because Miss So and So, first grade teacher, you don't understand the impression that you have on a child because you are like a goddess, God to that person, <laughs> to that kid, and you told them that you can't do two minus three. So then all of a sudden, when I introduce integers to them, they're like, wait a minute, I can do that? You have like, and they've been thinking that for a long time because if you have two investments, you can't take away three of them. Well, if you have two dollars, your bank can take away three. <laughs> that bank can do that. And then it's like, oh. But, and, and that's just an example, but think of all the things that happen that you have to inherit. And then even you as higher ed, you're like, oh, shoot, I gotta unteach a whole bunch before I can teach what they need to learn, right? So how do we even think about that readiness piece? And then some of it is just doing some things differently. So can students take the remedial course as their senior year math course in high school? So that way they don't have to spend time. What's the issue around that? Is that a labor issue, a money issue? So how do we deal with the labor side? Because maybe who, who gets to teach the class? PSC, is it the ASC over in the uh, community? So how do we address those conversations? Because in the end, if we can't get that done, take care of who's most negatively impacted. Students. So if I'm getting a, a class that's equivalent to a, a senior level math class in high school, but it deals with the remediation of what I need to go into a higher ed, why can't we, why, why is it that we can't figure that out? We have, so those are the things that we're trying to figure out right now. So my office, which was once just but in the first term, very much operations of PHL pre-K and community schools, and you know the local control with the policy piece. My office is now all policy. I used to have this many people on my team. Now it's like two people because all everything went over to the office of children's families. So I'm like now I'm staffing up the office. But it's only going to be about four of us, and we're just doing all policy. Um, and it is working with CPP about building up the program and a number of other things that we're doing about local control. Um, so. Once again, I talked about pre-K, so I can kind of skip through that piece as well. We talked about the community schools. When we think about community schools, though, but these are the important buckets. Um, and like I said, I don't go back to pre-K, just so you understand where we're going. We are aiming for 6,000 for this uh, upcoming year. Um, and like I said, we're, we have added uh, this year, this current year, instructional coaching um, for our pre-K facility, but we need to ramp that up. And the problem is just like any other investment. So those of you who are familiar with the read by fourth course the city has been doing. So that's great work that they've been doing, but there's issues that can impact that. And like people say, oh, is read by four is working? It works where you have consistency and instruction. But when a school either loses a position, or someone retires, or they have to level, and all of a sudden those investments, so that 
core group of teachers that you have working in, you know, from kindergarten or grade one through three, working together, all of a sudden gets shifted every year. That investment of professional development is now somewhere else. So how do we maintain investment in the early years to make sure that if we are going to do certain things around literacy, and hopefully they'll have numerous things like that, I think they are, um, in terms of, because uh, they need to address some of the mathematics issues as well, but how do we make sure that those investments are, are, are not wasted because of other things that are dictating the system? And so how do we keep those grades whole so that way the students enter into the fourth grade? Now they are all ready for uh, reading and learning. And so those are pieces that uh, we are really trying to work with as well. Um, for uh, in the pre-K, getting them ready for that, but then also working with the district to keep the whole with the additional investment. Community schools, if you really think about some of the major components we have there, Pre-K, I mean, program expansion, we want to add. Each school gets a coordinator uh, whose responsibility is to deal with non-academic issues to help coordinate services and partners with the school. Um, so that a lot of that work is going on. An investment in out-of-school time, so if we are OST, it is just making sure that there are quality programs, once again, around quality, evidence-based programs that will act actively engage students, but increase enrollment, I mean, attendance is a, is a major piece, and hopefully for um, to lead to more instructional time academic outcomes. Arts and cultural program we have in the building, working and getting schools open. That is a big deal here in the city of Philadelphia. That has been very challenging because once again, the city does not own the school. The district owns the school building. So even when we try to get buildings open, we either have to pay or have certain agreements to keep buildings open for programs. Where in other cities where it's just like the gym is open at night. So that way you you know so you have the parks and rec the rec center gym that might be open, but if there's not a rec center in the area, the school is like the rec center at night. And so students can go, or young people can go and have safe spaces with caring adults for engaging programs. Adults have meeting spaces for neighborhood or community meetings. Because if you notice in environments where you see that, and that's what I saw in the birds. I said the suburban school is a community school. The high school, because I was in Springfield, only one high school. That school did everything. That school did, I said, oh, this is a community school. Once I started to learn about it, but you don't think about it that way, because it's just a, it's a local high school. But you have community meetings there. You have performances there. You have spring and summer activities and sports there on the field. People go to the high school for all types of things. And so how do we make sure we bring that spirit here to Philadelphia? And also, we have adult um, education classes that are going on. I'm going to be mindful of that. So I talked about affordable access to community college. That is work that we're going to be doing now. So I probably I spoke to some folks over here, leadership that we will be looking for people to kind of look at our program and think about and advise how we're going to do it and do it right. Because we have to make sure that we get it right. We know we won't get it right the first year. We don't have to tinker it, but we want to know what needs to be baked in the first year to make it short success. Because you can always add things in. You don't want to have to, I mean, add on top of some things, but what are the things that we have to add at the very baseline to make to ensure um, success? Um, and like I said, the important piece is really strengthening that um, CCP. For those who are not going into the workforce, you know, if they have earned a credential and they're going right to the workforce, those that are going to the four-year stage, we need to make sure that we make those transitions smooth, have really good articulation agreements, and students don't have to redo certain classes, you know, even, and, and making sure that that investment is there. And how do we even think about maintaining services? We're not there yet because we're just going to get started. So, but once they start meeting, how do we, you know, each campus has a food cupboard, emergency services, da 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 da. Is that an additional investment? College? Is that something that the city does, or is it something in terms of human services? How do we do that work so that way, as people come to Philadelphia, which we all know, second largest metropolitan area for Ed and Ed, how do we should be at the forefront of what students need and make sure that we're or, or, or dealing with students' needs here in the city of Philadelphia? And right now, we have a mayor who's willing to do it. So the the the, the stronger the collective impact is, especially from higher ed, on how to do this, makes it harder for whoever the next mayor is to undo it. So that's why that 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 piece is going to be very important because all of you know whether it was you yourself or you know friends or you have students right now they are hungry they are trying to figure out what they want to do next they're couch surfing they're doing this and, and they're still trying to stay in school full time and they're working hard to do that or when you learn about someone who says you're like how did you do that they're doing really well and thriving and you find out they have this amazing and sometimes sad story though but those we don't want those amazing stories. How do we eliminate that so that way they can just focus on what they're doing? All right? So that's the intersection of education working group. Right? Exactly. Chief Education Officer. Thank you.
and you know, I'll do a little bit of this because there's just a lot. So, but we'll have to take some questions. We'll be able to about 20 minutes for questions. And we have people online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So I have a question around the behavioral health work that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, coming from, I taught in Florida and I have friends who still teach there and the county that I work in is asked all of the teachers to provide a like mini course to all of their students about behavioral health. Yeah, it, it was not a good scene. So <laughs> um, there, there's been tons of high school parts with a lot of them. So right. The space was craziness. But, um, so I wanted, could you talk more about what that looks like in so, terms of each school? Is it a person? Is it like what? So what the, are the options? So with the uh, behavioral health, there will be a provider who is assigned to a school. And the thing is, so and it's, I'm going to try to do it as simply as possible. Yeah. Um, so you have a number of providers who are already existing, and you have children who are already involved. But once they hit high school, like the high school part is really hard because kids go everywhere. So does the provider follow the child because that's who the parents are working with, and you're getting so each school will have a provider. Um, we're working on even adding another position, if we can, to be like a behavioral health specialist B, especially if you have to coordinate multiple providers in the building, um, because that is something as a principal, I might have been a good principal, but I'm not, I, don't, I don't know that world. Like, it's just like asking teachers to teach a course on those things. I was going to ask you, you can't ask me to teach you health on behavioral health. I, I, that's not something I was trained to do. If someone asks me a question, I don't know. i got to look it up. I still might find the wrong information because I'm not an expert. So how do you do that? It will include some training, though, for staff to identify certain pieces or how to treat or engage students when they're having a bad day or not to put them in certain situations. Um, but it is, so there will be some staff training for that. But we really wanted to make sure that we are, once again, high expectation, high support. So the expectations that have this, what are the support structures that need to happen in each building? So if it is having, especially in schools of higher needs, and we're even, and we're looking at, we know where the, most critical mass of kids are that need behavioral health, right? But, you know, some of your highest performing schools, yes, they need support, but it's not the same extent to a school that's like in a tough part of like, you know, Kensington or something like that. Because those kids are dealing with a number of different issues. So how do you make sure that you have like, not just, even if it's a community school, you have a coordinator on dealing with certain pieces, but you also have that behavioral health coordinator just to make sure that those things are happening. The other piece that I'm really pushing for and hoping that, that the principal does have to have a very, has to have to take a leadership role. So one thing that, like one of the things that we did in South Philly all the time was, um, I had, I, I was a good, I had a lot of meetings, but they were meetings, but they were very meaningful, very intentional. So, you know, one I learned in the birds, they used to do these child studies. I didn't know what a child study meeting was. Because in Germantown, there was, I, I didn't, we never did a child study meeting in my year in South Philly. Then I get to the birds and it was like, the principal, the assistant principal, the dean, the nurse, the counselor, the this, the that. We met every week and we talked about kids. What's going on? Someone's attendance is crazy right now. Did we call the home? Did we find out? Someone's behavior has been erratic. There was a death in the family. There was this. Okay, what are the supports? When we meet next week, we're going to check back in. Identify new kids on the list. So those are things we did in South Philly. And people are like, oh, where did you get that? I'm like, the birds have been doing this. Why aren't we all doing this? So how do you teach principals though how to use that time and also understand <laughs> that investment of time is actually worth it? Because so sometimes it's like, well, I need to, I need to do observation. Yeah, but if your school is off the hook, now you're just in another, it's, it's not a meeting, but you're not out in the hallway dealing with something that crazy. So let's deal with some of the behavioral issues and really put some systems in place. Because I have my school police and I even have my custodian in my school. Because it, it, when it comes down to building safety, right? If the building's one, physically appealing, like as clean as it can be, as bright as it can be, because that impacts how people say so what's going on. But really being very intentional, and those are things that we're trying to build in um, with the behavioral health data. But it's going to be it's going to be really hard. Yeah. But I think we're, we'll get there. Any other questions? Questions back? Um, I have a question about how Um, so one is around innovation. 
So how do, when we think about what we're trying to do, and one thing, this is under this administration, so we want to get some things that will last. And so how can we be innovative? How do we, we think about, one, when I go back to, let me go back to this slide. So great teaching and learning. College of Education. What are some things that need to happen for teachers? What does professional development look like, you know, right now in the city of Philadelphia? So whether it be a charter school, a district school, what does that look like? And how can schools of education help support what's the, the, the latest and the greatest tried and true evidence-based practices that really work for specific schools or a specific community that really work? And I think being very much involved in that process is important. When you think about great space, it's just innovative. Like as we look, one thing when I walk through the space, I said, okay, this looks like this was like influenced by educators, by the brightness, the colors, the art. It just feels like educator space. You go into other schools, you know, in the university, and it feels like or that department. This feels like an educator space. And so, how do we inform people what those spaces can look like once again? Um, I think the other part is in terms of is just advice on what should what should we do as a, what are the things that need to happen? So how do you inform policy? So I think giving us the, the, um, the insights that you have are very helpful to us because, I mean, I work on the city side, but I'm one of the very few people who had a background in education, but we make policy. How does that influence council members? Most of them don't have background in education, but they make decisions on who funded, policy that impacts schools, let alone what happens at the state level. That's a whole number. Ball game. Right? But how does that how does that work? So when we need validators from time to come out, like you can talk about programs, we use a lot of uh, folks um, from Drexel actually to talk about the pre-K work, the investment, why it was important to do that. Because there were some people that why should we invest in babysitters? Because that's what they were calling it, or daycare versus child care versus actual pre-K classroom. So I think educating the public is very important and bringing that, bringing that uh, perspective is very important to <laughs> the work that we do. So that way we can make more people a little more expert of an expert or a little more educated in the areas where we're trying to make that impact um, is important. But the teacher readiness, I would always say, that how do we make sure our teachers are ready when they go to the classroom? How do we recruit um, diverse teacher pool to make sure that they're ready to go into the school? Giving them really meaningful um, like student um, teaching and placement so that way, and are they willing to go into some of our students with high speed? But what are the skills that they need to do that? I think is also very important just being very active. I think our conversations for the universities is going to be a little bit different when we think about, you know, spaces. Uh, we think about the impact that Drexel is having in West Coast. We think of, talk about the impact that, you know, the University of Penn has had and everyone talks about, um, you know, Penn Alexander, what it has done to that neighborhood. For good and for bad, depending on how you look at it, but it has had an impact that's just like, oh, wait a minute, but there, there, there's some secret sauce there and can we do some other things that maybe without, depending on what you think of the positive or the negative, more of the positive and maybe less of the negative and transform neighborhoods. So those things, and the rest of I know is very much involved in what's happening on this side of the hill to make sure that those things are happening. And I think a lot of learnings from what they saw there to say, okay, okay, you know what? Yeah, we can invest in schools here, create academically rich environments and give us some other models that we can do. So I think it's also just being leaders in their community and having positive impact with people who currently live there um, and to see if they can change, you know, the conversation around, you know, is it just an effort to justify this for the never? So like I said, I, I grew up here, I've witnessed all of these things. Right? When I look at Clark Park from what it was when I was a kid to what it is now, but that's a totally different space uh, from what it was growing up in West Coast. Um, so, but I think that, and there's, uh, you know, other opportunities I think for schools to, to improve the teaching space. Mr. Hackney, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Hi, this is Bill Lynch. First, I want to thank you for taking your time today to share the ideas with us and I think a very focused and, and uh, positively aspirational agenda. I appreciate it. Secondly, uh, my question is this. You, you've talked a lot about um, the public schools and included charter schools in a brief comment, but could you talk about the relationship that you hope to develop, if, if one at all, uh, with other providers in the, um, in the, within the school district geography. So specifically private schools, parochial schools, and, and of course, charter schools. Um, 
that any kind of provider, they, they seems to me that they serve uh, some of the audience, uh, meaning our children and parents in Philadelphia. So could you talk about how that relationship might develop? Um, yes, thank you for the compliment and the question. Um, so, and I'll give you an immediate example that I gave, like it just happened yesterday. So there's a, um, a bill uh, before city council that's talking about giving preference to, and that means like for the civil service exam, additional points, for students who graduate from CTE program from the school district of Philadelphia. And so I was there yesterday and gave testimony that says, great, I believe in the spirit of what you're trying to do, because we want to get, include more students, but you have students who have attended charter schools, parochial schools, private schools, depending on this, and they may also graduate with some work-ready certificates. So do we want to, we want to make sure that it's inclusive of students, regardless of what school, because we talk about school choice, but often it's not the student's choice, it's the parent's choice, right? And so, and I'm, you know, we can talk about that a little bit later if you want to. But for a student, I didn't want us to have, once again, a policy that could negatively impact students because the parents said, no, I want you to go to charter school. And they went to the charter school and they earned a certificate that would prepare them to go immediately into the workforce, but they don't get preference because they're all public school students. And this is the dynamic that we live in. So we are trying to work uh, to be very mindful that policies we put in place don't negatively impact that sector. Going back to like the RP for behavioral health though, that is just with the school district. The, the, the challenging part of working with charter schools or with private schools, or the rules are very different. Each charter school is, is its own LEA. So basically they're their own district. So if we're going to do something with the district, we only have one general council we have to work with. We only have one group of folks and we can have massive impact for many children. When you work with charter schools, we have to have an MOU with each and every individual charter. So the time to get certain things up and running, so it's not like we won't add to it if possible, but to do it, it just takes it just takes so much more time. And so I think there are a number of challenges, um, certain things that we like to do as a school. So people would always often ask us, are you going to do community schools or charter schools? And it was just like, well, let's we're going to do district schools first, just for the very reason that I explained. And then, but also when you go to some charter schools, they have already set up, you go there and you're like, you have a number of supports that are already built in, but you just want the designation and whatever you think the promise of that is, or is it just a challenge to the administration or why aren't you doing this as part of it? But you go into a number of charter schools, they have a lot of the components already in place. So it's not, and not everyone, but not all of them, but a lot of them do. And so it's just a number of challenges. And then when you talk about the parochial schools, that is a whole other challenge within itself, which, you know, because of competition with the expansion of charter schools, um, capital schools, parochial schools, their attendance is ridiculously low. And then how do we fund them? Um, because they sometimes want public dollars. And then you got to balance just the, I mean, that is something that has just never really happened in government. I think some, someone's trying to change that now. See, and, um, you may have a bit, some opinions on that versus government schools. Um, and so I think we're really trying to figure out how do we provide support. I do work with a number of charter schools. I talk to charter schools around a number of issues all the time, even around renewals and just how do they, what are the things that need to happen? So we do try to work with them, but it is, it is definitely a challenge because they're still independent. And it's not one conversation, not to say that it's not worth the effort. It's just very challenging and daunting because they have so many different needs and so many different perspectives and so many different agendas that it's a huge challenge to work with charter schools across the city. Um, because and then when it comes to the bigger pieces, when we ask more of the state, sometimes around funding, then the charter school agenda is very different than what the school district agenda is. Even though people say, well, a third of the kids in the city go to charter school. I'm like, right, but two thirds go to district school. So the majority is still there. So we have to make sure that the funding and that the uh, charter school law is, is make sure that it deals with it from an equity perspective in terms of how it impacts school. So I'm not pro or anti-charter. I do have issues with charter school law. I have issues with funding. Uh, charter schools are here to stay. I know that all of a sudden charter is not gonna close tomorrow. So that's why I'm, I'm not even part of that fight anymore. But it is, how do we make sure that the funding is appropriate? And while students are in a district school and a charter school, how do we just create the, the most academically rich environment? Make sure that students are coming out ready to work. But so, but we are very mindful Thank you. Um, 
there's a lot closer to that question. <laughs> um, so the so the <laughs> there's a couple things. So when we look at the justice component, right? That's once again a different arm of city government that I know that they have some programs that take place in school and they're trying to figure out more ways to do it. Um, when we think about equity, I think from the mayor's perspective is how do we make sure in terms of criminal justice or how students um, or young people are treated by in, in, in terms of policing? Um, how are those things going to be different? You know, he just brought on a new uh, police commissioner. So expectations are ridiculously high for uh, Chief Outlaw for what she has to do here in the city of Philadelphia. And those are things that I know she's going to begin to address. Um, one, first dealing with the violence that's going on in the city, I think, is first and foremost that they have to figure out. But in terms of justice, how students are being treated, uh, especially young people, I should say, in the city, how they're being treated in terms of um, that approach. The district has brought on someone, uh, Kevin Bethel, a really interesting guy who was a police officer for like 30 years, is now um, responsible for that work in the school district and thinking about diversion programs, which I'm a big fan of. Because uh, one thing when I said earlier for students not having a bad moment turn into a bad day. So when a student does or may be on the brink of doing something, do they have to be arrested right away? Um, and so how do we think differently about how we report certain things and then how they're handled? So an example that I, I like to give when I was at South Philly um, is I had a student who brought a knife to school. And at the time, if you bring a knife to school, we immediately call the police because you brought a weapon. So I get called to the school police office, and it was uh, principal had me. Student brought a knife. We're about to call 911. Like, well, first, tell me I need some more information. So let me get some more information. Yes, the student brought a knife to school. Young young woman from Central America had a knife, but with that knife, she also had a fork <coughs> and a pork chop and lunch that her parent made for her that day. But they're new to the country, and so they didn't know the rules. So it was just a steak knife and a fork, but it, she had a knife, and, we're, and they were really going to call police. I said, we can't call the police. I said, you can call that in the 440 if they got a weapon, and you tell 440 that the principal said, no, we're not going to call 911, because we can just call the parent, and they can just come and pick it up. She can have a lunch. She just can't keep the knife. And so bringing that mind, and I've had a conversation with Kevin Buck, and I gave him that example. He said, we need to do more of that. And so it's really, people are having these conversations of how do we treat children? Um, um, in, in, in the school district or in our public school and in public spaces, so that way they're not on that school of prison pipeline because of a simple incident that didn't need a suspension, did, like the girl wasn't suspended, because some, some people said, well, we're not going to call, we're going to suspend her for written sentence. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to educate her and her parents to what you can and what you can't bring to school. And so it's really, that's the education component to getting, once again, what do the adults do? Because the, the young lady's behavior, did she do something wrong? Technically, she did, but how do we make sure the behavior of the adult is, is, is that awareness is there? So I think there's certain pieces that we talk about educating the young people. A lot of that can be done through how the adult demonstrates and lead what should happen. On that. The homelessness issue is something that is a very tough challenge. Um, and so there are different, and I'm not an expert on that component, so I can't speak to that. Uh, but when we talk about the, the criminal justice work and using things through a racial equity lens. So like this Friday, we had a big training for all uh, senior uh, um, cabinet and commissioners around racial equity training in terms of, once again, how do, you, how do we use a racial equity lens on the program? So and when we do our budget, and so in government, we actually moving, they're gonna be, they're gonna pilot it with a few departments and part of your budget proposal that you have to do to um, the budget and finance office and with the office of um, uh, racial equity, is really talking about explicitly how is your work going to impact people. And so that is a, a huge thing. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but any of you that have ever had to put on it, do a budget and do budget proposals, if someone says, okay, now put a racial equity lens on that proposal. You have to be very thoughtful. So you have to make sure that you have people in the room when you're designing the, or putting the budget together that understands those issues and very sensitive to those issues. And so we have to make sure that those departments are staffed appropriately the budget and the racial equity office is staffed appropriately to make sure we can help departments get there. So that way, when we go across the entire city and do it, that every department knows exactly like, okay, this is how we'll positively impact this community. Now, so the, these are the things that could go wrong or negatively impact, so we need to be mindful of that. So it's really at that level that, once again, your budget reflects your value. Your budget reflects your value. So putting that in is massive. To the general public, 
it was just an announcement. The people who really have to build do this work, when you have to build that into your budget and you're going to be held accountable to now metrics, because every time when we submit our budget, we have to submit metrics and now uh, our and, and goals for the year. When you have to submit that and it's reflected in your budget and you have council holding you accountable, the public holding you accountable, the media holding, those things are how we're beginning to address some of the issues that we're talking about. We have time for one more question. Yes. Sorry, the light was mine. That was last week. Okay, first I would say go back into the mayor's tweets around these issues and you will feel like, so he is obviously um, is in strong opposition to, you know, events like that. Have to hear and see what's up here. Um, so yeah, so what happened was, and I don't, some of the details are, it's a little mixed, but basically there was a, a, a mother that was detained dropping her child off at school. What's not clear to me, at least from what I know as, as of the time, was it on after school property or like right up in the street. And so, but that's very traumatizing because it happened at 8 o'clock in the morning. So other people are dropping their kids off, but you also obviously, you know, I shouldn't say obviously, but that's probably not the only person in that community that might fall into that category. So what does that do to the community? Because I got a phone call later on the day, and they're like, parents are scared to come to the school to pick up their children. So if parents are traumatized, kids may not know what's going on yet, but if we get to the end of the school day, it's like, who's coming to pick up a child? Now all of a sudden, you, you ever had your kids be the last one to get picked up? That can be a little traumatized. And I'm using a little humor there, but it's it's real, right? Um, and so no, we are we we actively once we learned of that, we rallied a lot of um, our resources to get to the school, but also working with the district around because they do have a like an ice poop kit, and it sounds funny. Um, but in terms of what happens if this if something like this happens at your school, what actions should you take? I mean, obviously we're not asking the school police or 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 the principal to jump out in front of the ice officer or whatever. Um, but making sure that you call the city right away um, so that way we can get people there. And then also if there's things, now the, the mother was released at the end of the day, so I don't even know once again what the, the full story was for that, but that is something that we don't want to see happen in our schools or on school property. Um, so we do try to maintain those same spaces as much as possible, um, but there's still always going to be those issues. And I think we, I mean, we've had legal battles that we've had with the Fed. We've won them, uh, but there's still certain things that they can do um, that we still try to prohibit if we can. Uh, so, but no, that was something that was really, I mean, I just talked to him on Monday when we were in doing interviews, he stopped in and we had talked about it um, as well because he was aware of what was going on. And so just really trying to make sure how do we, how, one, how do we address what's going on in that community? So there are a couple community meetings that are happening there um, and our offices are involved, or city offices are involved in that to make sure that the community feels safe. So they know the city is on their side. So let's uh, give Otis a round of applause. And to show our appreciation for your presentation, and thanks for coming here. What a wonderful job that you did. Thank you very much. It's not more than $25, dollars is I work for the city. Don't give me trouble. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> you got me. I got you. <laughs> Thank you once again. Was <laughs> I wasn't. I was talking <laughs>
Excuse me one second. Thank you very much for the support. Sure. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. A lot of my work will be doing research about the Haiti experience. I have no idea. Oh, I'm not sure. We're probably still on this hour. One, I don't know that. I, I, I don't speak to it. 